Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm Peter Hames, co-founder of Big Health. And what I'd like to talk about today is the idea and the impending reality of digital medicine. So taking what Sean has talked about and trying to extend that and look at how this stuff is going to have a real impact uh, more broadly um, you know, in mainstream health. Um, so I think before we start talking about digital medicine, we should start with plain old, boring, normal medicine. Now, we live in a world where healthcare is dominated by pharmaceuticals. So in the last 10 years alone, the spend on drugs has nearly doubled. And the pharma industry is the largest spender on political lobbying than of, of all of the sectors. So it, it spends more than gas, oil, tobacco, and guns combined. Right? So it's probably no surprise that pretty much every aspect of healthcare, from medical training to regulation to reimbursement, is shaped to fit the pharma industry. Now, I don't say this to have a go at the pharma industry. Uh, I say it to raise the question, like, how did they do it? To me, like, they're doing something really, really right. And I think that the answer is, uh, is, is held within the fundamentals, uh, the fundamental qualities of drugs themselves. So for the best part of the last 100 years, drugs have had a monopoly on scalable, affordable, evidence-based, and standardized healthcare. There has literally been no other type of healthcare that exhibits these qualities. And these are incredibly adaptive qualities, if you think about it competitively. And so the growth of, of farmers' influence and size has basically continued unchallenged by meaningful competitors. Now, alongside this, we now have, as Sean has intimated, decades of clinical evidence that behavioral medicine, such as cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT, is way, way more effective than drugs at addressing a whole array of chronic conditions, ranging from sleep problems through to depression and anxiety. However, of the billions of people who suffer from these problems, the vast majority get access to nothing but pills. And this I do have a problem with. Now, I was one of these people. So a few years ago, I developed insomnia, which was a pretty terrible experience. Uh, I'm fortunate that I studied experimental psychology at university. So I know the evidence behind CBT and promptly went to my doctor, kind of smugly pronounced my self-diagnosis of primary chronic insomnia. Uh, which doctors love, obviously, and, uh, and asked for a course of CBT. And he promptly told me where to stick it and gave me sleeping pills. And whatever I did, all I could get was drugs. So eventually, out of desperation, I got my hands on a self-help book written by a guy called Professor Colin Espy at the University of Glasgow and self-administered a course of CBT. And although the, the book was very manual and quite clunky in places, in just six weeks, I was totally better. Now, on a personal level, obviously, this is an incredible experience. But what it also did was raise the question for me, which was, can we use technology to deliver evidence-based behavioral medicine in a way that mimics all of the best qualities of drugs? So you know, if we can deliver scalable, affordable, evidence-based, standardized, non-drug healthcare, we stand in with a chance to deliver a new type of medicine, which is what we call digital medicine. And you know, if we do so, then for the first time ever, you know, we can actually get behavioral, evidence-based behavioral medicine to the millions, if not billions, of people who would benefit from it. So having had this epiphany, I then rang up Professor Espy, the right guy who wrote the book, put on a suit, went up to Glasgow, uh, and convinced him to be my co-founder. So he's, we, myself and Colin, Professor Espy, have founded Big Health. We're a digital medicine company. And our first product addresses the very problem that I myself experienced. So Sleepio is a digital CBT sleep improvement program, clinically proven to help overcome even long-term poor sleep. You access it via web and mobile, and it's fully automated. So there's no clinicians in the background deciding what you get, but very, very highly tailored to each individual's needs and goals. And crucially, the whole thing is designed to feel more like entertainment than medicine. So the program is presented by your virtual animated sleep expert, the prof, and his narcoleptic dog, Pablo. <coughs> So let me introduce you to the prof now. So I don't know if anyone here is called Chris, uh, but if there is someone here, then he's talking to you directly. Welcome to Sleepio. I'm the prof, and I'm here to do everything I can to help you sleep better. Now, you may be thinking, why should I trust you to tell me what to do? Well. Everything we do here 
you sleep your is rooted firmly in scientific evidence and designed by some of the world's leading experts in sleep. So that's the prof. So you check in with him once a week. He gives you a tailored progress review and personalized cognitive and behavioral techniques to help you sleep better. And in the process, he unlocks a whole array of digital tools to help you put that into practice. So this is your sleep diary, um, displays the data in a very intuitive way. This is how you tell the prof how you're progressing. You can fill it in manually. So it takes less than a minute to fill in each day. Or if you do have a tracking device like a Fitbit or Jawbone, you can connect it to your Sleepio account and import that data automatically. Now, everybody's different. So you get to pick uh, your personalized goals. Right? Do you want to get to sleep more easily, stay asleep through the night, feel better during the day? And then we algorithmically track your progress against those goals based on the data that we collect from you. Now, a good example of how this is more than just an app uh, is your schedule. So this is your idealized 24-hour routine. It's different for everybody, and it evolves as you move through the program. So the prof builds it with you. Um, and as a result of this, we know when you're meant to be in bed. So if you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't sleep, you access Sleepio on your phone, the prof appears in his dressing gown. He's like, oh, Chris, what seems to be the problem? Like, you can't sleep, eh? Let's get you out of bed, have a look at your relaxation plan. He pulls up your relaxation plan that you've built with him in the previous session, unlocks some relaxation audio, and helps you get back to sleep. And then the morning, an hour after we know from your data that you're, you specifically normally wake up, he'll then send you a, a notification or a text message saying, Chris, we're so sorry you woke up last night. Happens to the best of us. You know, fill in your diary while it's still fresh in your mind. So that sort of narrative component, that human element that we're trying to synthesize, is a big part of our hypothesis as to how we can uh, you know, you know, capture that active element that Sean was talking about with face-to-face -face therapy in an automated and therefore scalable way. Final thing to mention, and Sean talked a lot about uh, the importance of social interactions in getting clinical effect. <laughs> the community aspect of Sleepio is an intrinsic part of the intervention, and it's one of the things that I'm proudest of. So you know, we've structured the community in such a way that the social currency is helpfulness. So peer uh, ratings of how helpful each, other, each, of, each user is, rather than you know, quality over quantity. And we automatically match make graduates of the program with new users to sort of peer support people through the program. Uh, and this is largely based on the fact that you know, we may be experts in the science, but the users themselves and the participants are experts in the implementation of these techniques and the barriers that people may come across. Now, all of this is, oh, there he is. There's the prof in his dressing gown, sort of blinking. Um, totally irrelevant if it doesn't work. So we conducted the world's first placebo-controlled randomized trial for a digital sleep intervention. Um, created a complete fake version of the program with a prof who gave you basically convincing nonsense with the placebo group. And the results, thankfully, showed that Sleepio is comparable in effectiveness to face to face therapy. So, even with very long term poor sleepers who'd had problems with for over a decade, on average, at follow up, so eight to ten weeks after treatment ended, people were falling asleep over 50% faster staying asleep over 60% longer through the day, and all of their daytime measures were up, so energy, concentration, and so forth. And excitingly, in addition to this, we weren't trying to achieve this, but we found that all depression, anxiety, and stress measures were all significantly down as well, which again, intuitively makes sense. And finally, of course, people actually did it. So high rates of adherence and uh, satisfaction. So that's what we're doing in the digital medicine domain. Uh, I think that one of the uh, most exciting things for me is to see the ecosystem of digital me medicine evolving and emerging uh, before our very eyes. And this ranges from you know, Ginger IO's uh, use of organic cell phone data to automatically detect conditions like depression, uh, you know, Propella Health's FDA approved COPD intervention that uses sensor data from the inhaler as well as a mobile health platform, um, right through to augmented existing clinician platforms. So Babylon Health in the UK has created a mobile platform that aggregates sensor data from trackers and then makes the clinician uh, consultation over the phone super efficient and allows them to refer into um, digital therapeutics directly from the app. And of course, we've heard about Amada's awesome pre-diabetes intervention. Now, the thing that unifies all of these and what we're seeing is these emerging class of digital medicine intervention is a heavy use of objectively tracked data, be it a set of weighing scales or a very specific device on an inhaler in the case of Propeller Health. Um, you know, wearable devices and sort of the wearable sector has got a lot of attention over the last couple of years. 
Um, and you know, devices such as Fitbit and Jawbone and the new Apple Watch are great, but what excites me most about them is that they indicate a direction of travel. You know, they're the first step towards a world in which track data becomes a normal part of everyday life. You know, we're already starting to see this. So you know, uh, the M7 chip in the iPhone, equivalent sensors in Samsung's phones, you know, we're moving towards a situation where track data is entirely passive. And that's really the, the, the bar that we have to get to for this to become a mainstream mass uh, phenomenon. <laughs> but from a digital medicine perspective, the reason that this is exciting is because of the, the new types of intervention that we can develop on top of this data. So if you consider for a moment uh, the way that um, traditional behavioral medicine is delivered, um, as Sean referenced, you know, face to face, this is almost like a medieval model, you know, like, like trudging along to the blacksmith kind of once a week, you know, and you, know, you don't really know what you're getting and it's not standardized and you see them for an hour and then you sort of trudge back home and that's it. And then you see them in a week and you lie about what you did and that's more or less how it goes. But, you know, that, that model, that medieval model, is already seven to eight times more effective than drugs, <laughs> right? So there's something magical in there. Now, if you imagine for a moment that we can create using this real-time track data, you know, not just interventions that are personalized based on differences between people, so traits-based differences, but differences between your need states moment by moment, like delivering state-dependent help to you. Now, if you compare the level of care, you know, why is face-to-face -face the gold standard? You know, if we can build interventions that react in that way, by rights, we should annihilate existing standards of adherence and outcomes. And that, for me, should be the standard for digital medicine. It's not let's meet what exists. We should be going beyond what any existing type of medicine can do. So that's all wonderful and you know, hoverboard-like in its kind of uh, imagery. Um, the real question is, is, how do we make digital me medicine a mainstream reality? And you know, that question, the answer to that question is very complex. It involves regulation, it involves procurement, but I think there are certain structural things occurring that are really promising. So uh, at the top of the day, Vivek was talking about health kit, and I'm in total agreement. You know, we're seeing the emergence of these consumer health platforms, health kit being the, the leading one thereof, and I think that health kit's greatest innovation is also one of its quietest, which is that from the get-go, from inception, it was built to integrate with existing traditional healthcare systems. You know, so you know, in the UK, we, and, and to say, I mean, the, thing, the impact that I think that has is, it, with a single kind of elegant, uh, you know, in, in an elegant one fell swoop, it immediately removes one of the major barriers to digital medicine interventions integrating with traditional care, just like out the box. Right? So in the UK, we, you know, this is happening now. We're seeing EMIS, which is the leading electronic health records provider with 39 million patient records under management, has just announced a couple of months ago it's integrated with healthcare. In the US, Epic are doing trials with Duke. You know, so this stuff is happening right now, and it opens a pipeline from what we would normally consider to be consumer app developers right into the heart of traditional medicine. So in summary, to conclude, um, I believe that we're in a position where technology offers us an incredible opportunity to deliver evidence-based behavioral medicine to people in a way that mimics the best qualities of drugs. Uh, track data affords us opportunities to go way beyond what drugs or any other type of healthcare has provided. And there are structural changes like HealthKit, which I think are promising for the prospects of digital medicine becoming a mainstream reality. And the net result of all this, which is the thing that is most important, is that for the first time in human history, we stand to be able to deliver evidence-based non-drug interventions to the millions and billions of people who would benefit from it. Thank you very much. <laughs>